Hello, this is the beginning of chapter 16 of the American Pageant textbook. For a moment, I'm going to go back to the previous pages to set the scene for the part three of the, of the text, Testing the Nation, 1820 to 1877. This, uh, this chapter is the first chapter in a series of chapters that bring us up to the Civil War and the leading causes of the Civil War and the numerous issues that it that involves. Uh, here we go. The Civil War of 1861 to 1865 was the awesome trial by fire of American nationhood and of the American soul. All Americans knew, said Abraham Lincoln, that slavery was somehow the cause of this war. The war tested in Lincoln's ringing phrase at Gettysburg whether any nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal can long endure. How did this great and bloody conflict come about, and what were its results? American slavery was, by any measure, a peculiar institution. Slavery was rooted in both racism and economic exploitation, and depended for its survival on brutal repression. Yet the American slave population was the only enslaved population in history that grew by means of its own biological reproduction, a fact that suggests to many historians that conditions under slavery in the United States were somehow less punitive than those in other slave societies. Indeed, a distinctive and durable African-American culture managed to flourish under slavery further suggesting that slave, the slave regime provided some space for African-American cultural development. But however benignly it might be painted, slavery still remained a cancer in the heart of American democracy, a moral outrage that mocked the nation's claim to be a model of social and political enlightenment. As time went on, more and more voices called more and more stridently for its abolition. The nation lived uneasily with slavery from the outset. Thomas Jefferson was only one among many in the founding generation who felt acutely the conflict between the high principle of equality and the ugly reality of slavery. The federal government in the early republic took several steps to check the growth of slavery. It banned slavery in the Old Northwest in 1787, prohibited the further importation of slaves after 1808, and declared in the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that the vast western territories secured in the, in the Louisiana Purchase were forever close to slavery north of the state of Missouri. Anti-slavery sentiment even abounded in the South in the immediate post-revolutionary years, but as time progressed, and especially after Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in the 1790s, the Southern planter and class became increasingly dependent on slave labor to wring profits from the sprawling plantations that carpeted the South. As cotton cultivation spread westward, the South's stake in slavery grew deeper and the abolitionist outcry grew louder. The controversy over slavery significantly intensified following the war with Mexico in the 1840s. Mexico will poison us, predicted the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he proved distressingly prophetic. The lands acquired from Mexico, most of the present-day American Southwest, from Texas to California, reopened the question of extending slavery into the Western territories. The decade and a half following the Mexican War, from 1846 to 1861, witnessed a series of ultimately ineffective efforts to come to grips with that question, including the ill-starred Compromise of 1850, the conflict-breeding Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, and the Supreme Court's inflammatory decision in the Dred Scott case of 1857. Ultimately, the slavery question was settled by force of arms in the Civil War itself. The Civil War, as Lincoln observed, was assuredly about slavery, but as Lincoln also repeatedly insisted, the war was also about the viability of the Union, as well and about the strength of democracy itself. Could a democratic government, built on the principle of popular consent, rightfully deny some of its citizens the same right to independence that the American revolutionaries had exercised in seceding from the British Empire in 1776? Southern rebels, calling the conflict the War of Southern Independence, asked that question forcibly, but ultimately it too was answered not in the law courts or in the legislative halls, but on the battlefield. The Civil War unarguably established the supremacy of the Union, and it ended slavery as well, but as the victorious Union set about the task of Reconstruction after the war's end in 1865, a combination of weak Northern will and residual Southern power frustrated the goal of making the emancipated blacks full-fledged American citizens. The Civil War, in the end, brought nothing but freedom, but over time, freedom proved a powerful tool indeed. Chapter 16, The South and the Slavery Controversy, 1793 to 1860. At the dawn of the Republic, slavery faced an uncertain future. Touched by revolutionary idealism, some Southern leaders, including Thomas Jefferson, were talking openly of freeing their slaves. 
Others predicted that the iron logic of economics would eventually expose slavery's unprofitability, speeding its demise. By the introduction, but the introduction, but the introduction of Eli Whitney's cotton gin in 1793 scrambled all of these predictions. Whitney's invention made possible the wide-scale cultivation of short staple cotton. The white fiber rapidly became the dominant southern crop, eclipsing tobacco, rice, and sugar. The explosion of cotton cultivation created an insatiable demand for labor, chaining the slave to the gin and the planter to the slave. As the 19th century opened, the reinvigoration of southern slavery carried fateful implications for blacks and whites alike, and threatened the survival of the nation itself. Cotton is king. As time passed, the cotton kingdom developed into a huge agricultural factory pouring out avalanches of the fluffy fiber. Quick profits drew planters to the virtual virgin bottomlands of the Gulf states. As long as the soil was still vigorous, the yield was bountiful and the rewards were high. Caught up in an economic spiral, the planters bought more slaves and land to grow and more cotton, so as to buy still more slaves and land. Northern shippers reaped a large part of the profits from the cotton trade. They would load bulging bales of cotton at southern ports, transport them to England, sell their fleecy cargo for pounds sterling, and buy needed manufacturing goods for the sale in the United States. To a large degree, the prosperity of both the North and the South rested on the bent backs of southern slaves. Cotton accounted for half the value of all American exports after 1840. The South produced more than half of the entire world's supply of cotton, a fact that held foreign nations in partial bondage. Britain was then the leading industrial power. Its most important single manufacturer in the 1850s was cotton cloth, from which about one-fifth of its population directly or indirectly drew its livelihood. About 75% of this precious supply of fiber came from the white carpeted acres of the South. Southern leaders were fully aware that Britain was tied to them by cotton threads, and this dependence gave them a heady sense of power. In their eyes, cotton was king, the gin was its throne, and the black bondsmen were its henchmen. If war should ever break out between the North and the South, Northern warships would presumably cut off the outflow of cotton. Fiber famished British factories would then close their gates, starving mobs would force the London government to break the blockade, and the South would triumph. Cotton was a powerful monarch indeed. The Planter Aristocracy Before the Civil War, the South was in some respects not so much a democracy as an oligarchy, or a government by the few, in this case heavily influenced by a planter aristocracy. In 1850, only 1,733 families owned more than 100 slaves each, and this select group provided the cream of the political and social leadership of the section and the nation. Here was the mint julep south of the tall columned and white planted plantation mansion, the big house where dwelt the cottonocracy. The planter aristocrats, with their blooded horses and their Chippendale chairs, enjoyed a lion's share of southern wealth. They could educate their children in the finest schools, often in the north or abroad. Their money provided the leisure for study, reflection, and statecraft, as was notably true of men like John C. Calhoun, a Yale graduate, and Jefferson Davis, a West Point graduate. Both those colleges are in the north. They felt a keen sense of obligation to serve the public. It was no accident that Virginia and the other southern states provided a higher proportion of front rank statesmen before 1860 than the dollar-grubbing north. But even in its best light, dominance by a favored aristocracy was basically undemocratic. It widened the gap between rich and poor. It hampered tax-supported tax public education because the rich planters could and did send their children to private institutions. A favorite author of elite southerners was Sir Walter Scott, whose manners and castles, graced by brave Ivanhoes and fair Rowanas, helped them idolize a feudal society, even when many of their economic activities were undeniably capitalistic. Southern aristocrats, who sometimes staged jousting tournaments, strove to perpetuate a type of medievalism that had died out in Europe, or was rapidly dying out. Mark Twain later accused Sir Walter Scott of having a hand in starting the Civil War. The British novelist, Twain said, aroused the Southerners to fight for a decaying social structure, a sham civilization. The plantation system also shaped the lives of Southern women. The mistress of a great plantation commanded a sizable household staff of mostly female slaves, she gave daily orders to cooks, maids, steamsters, laundresses, and body servants. Relationships between mistresses and slaves ranged from affectionate to atrocious. Some mistresses showed tender regard for their bondswomen, and some slave women took pride in their status as members of the household. But slavery strained even the bonds of womanhood. Virtually no slaveholding woman believed in abolition, and relatively few protested when the husbands and children of their slaves were sold. <laughs> 
One plantation mistress uh, harbored a special affection for her slave, Annika, but noted in her diary that, I whipped Annika for insolence. Slaves of the Slave System Unhappily, the Moonlight and Magnolia tradition concealed much that was worrisome, distasteful, and sordid. Plantation agriculture was wasteful, largely because King Cotton was and his money-hungry subjects despoiled the good earth. Quick profits led to excessive cultivation, or land butchery, which in turn caused a heavy leakage of population to the west and northwest. The economic structure of the south became increasingly monopolistic. As the land wore thin, many small farmers sold their holdings to more prosperous neighbors and went north or west. The big got bigger and the small smaller. When the Civil War finally erupted, a large percentage of southern farms had passed from the hands of the families that had originally cleared them. Another cancer in the bosom of the South was the financial instability of the plantation system. The temptation to overspeculate in land and slaves caused many planters, including Andrew Jackson in his later years, to plunge in beyond their depth. Although the black slaves might in extreme cases be fed for as little as 10 cents a day, there were other expenses. The slaves represented a heavy investment of capital, perhaps $1,200 each in the case of prime field hands, and they might deliberately injure themselves or run away. An entire slave quarters might be wiped out by disease or even by lightning, as happened in one instance to 20 ill-fated blacks. Dominance by King Cotton likewise led to a dangerous dependence on a one-crop economy, whose price level was at the mercy of world conditions. The whole system discouraged a healthy diversification of agriculture, and particularly of manufacturing. Southern planters resented watching the North grow fat at their expense. They were pained by the heavy outflow of commissions and interest to northern middlemen, bankers, agents, and shippers. True souls of the South, especially by the 1850s, deplored the fact that when, that when born, they were wrapped in Yankee-made swaddling clothes and they spent the rest of their lives in servitude to Yankee manufacturing. When they died, they were laden coffins held together with Yankee nails and were buried in graves dug with Yankee shovels. The South furnished the corpse and the hole in the ground. The King Cotton, the Cotton Kingdom, also repelled large-scale European immigration, which added so richly to the manpower and wealth of the North. In 1860, only 4.4% of the Southern population were foreign-born, as compared with 18.7% in the North. German and Southern, I'm sorry, German and Irish immigration to the South was generally discouraged by the competition of slave labor, by the high cost of fertile land, and by European ignorance of cotton growing. The diverting of a non British immigration to the north caused the white south to become the most Anglo-Saxon section of the country. The white majority. Only a handful of southern whites lived in Grecian pillared mansions. Below those 1,700 1,733 families in 1850 who owned 100 and more slaves were the less wealthy slave owners. They totaled in 1850 some 345,000 families, representing about 1,725,000 white persons. Over two-thirds of these families, 255,268 in all, owned fewer than 10 slaves each. All told, only about one-fourth of white Southerners owned slaves or belonged to a slave-owning family. The smaller slave owners did not own a majority of the slaves, but they made up the majority of the masters. These lesser masters were typically small farmers, with the striking exception <clears throat> that their household contained a slave or two, or perhaps in an entire slave family, the style of their lives probably resembled that of small farmers in the north more than it did the southern planter aristocracy. They lived in modest farmhouses and sweated beside their bondsmen in the cotton fields, laboring callous for callous just as hard as their slaves. Beneath the slave owning slave owners on the population pyramid was the great body of whites who owned no slaves at all. By 1860s, their numbers had swelled to 6,128,825,000. Three quarters of all the Southern whites, so just to pause for a second, three quarters of all Southern whites didn't own any slaves. <clears throat> Soldered off the richest bottomlands by the mighty planters, they scratched a simple living from the thin, thinner soils of the backcountry and the mountain valleys. To them, the riches of Cotton Kingdom were a distant dream, and they often sneered at the lordly pretensions of the cotton snobocracy. These redneck farmers participated in the market economy scarcely at all. As subsistence farmers, they raised <clears throat> corn and hogs, not cotton, and often lived isolated lives, punctuated periodically by extended socializing and sermonizing at religious camp meetings. Some of the least prosperous, non-slaveholding whites were scorned even by slaves as poor white trash. Known also as hillbillies, crackers, or clay eaters, they were often described as listless, shiftless, and misshapen. 
Later investigations have revealed that many of them were not simply lazy but sick, suffering from malnutrition and parasites, especially hookworm. All these whites, without slaves, had no direct stake in the preservation of slavery, yet they were among the stoutest defenders of the slave system. Why? The answer is not far to seek. This is a huge question. Why did most of these people defend the slave system so ardently, even though none of them actually owned any slaves? The carrot on the stick ever dangling before their eyes was the hope of buying a slave or two and of parlaying their paltry holdings into riches, all in accord with the American dream of upward social mobility. Just to pause for a minute, this ideal still plays large in American life. They also took fierce pride in their presumed racial superiority, which would be watered down if the slaves were freed. Many of the poor whites were hardly better off economically than the slaves. Some indeed were not so well off, but even the most wretched whites could take perverse comfort from the knowledge that they outranked someone in status, the still more wretched African-American slave. Thus did the logic of economics join with the illogic of racism in buttressing the slave system. In a special category among white Southerners were the mountain whites, more or less marooned in the valleys of the Appalachian Range that stretched from western Virginia to northern Georgia and Alabama. Civilization had largely passed them by, and they still lived under Spartan frontier conditions. They were a kind of living ancestry, for some of them retained Elizabethan speech forms and habits that had long since died out in Britain. As independent small farmers, hundreds of miles distant from the heart of the Cotton Kingdom, and rarely if ever in sight of a slave, these mountain whites had little in common with the whites of the flatlands. Many of them, including the future president, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, hated both the haughty planters and their gangs of blacks. They looked upon the impending strife between North and South as, quote, a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. When the war came, the tough-fibered mountain whites con constituted a vitally important peninsula of unionism jutting down into the secessionist southern sea. They ultimately played a significant role in crippling the Confederacy. Their attachment to the Union Party of Abraham Lincoln was such that for generations after the Civil War, the only concentrated Republican strength in the solid South was to be found in the southern highlands. Free Blacks, Slaves Without Masters Precarious in the extreme was the standing of the South's free blacks, who numbered about 250,000 by 1860. In the Upper South, the free black population traced its origin to a wavelet of emancipation inspired by the idealism of revolutionary days. In the Deeper South, many free blacks were mulattoes, usually the emancipated children of a white planter and his black mistress. Throughout the South were some free blacks who had purchased their freedom with earnings from labor after hours. Many free blacks owned property, especially in New Orleans, where a sizable mulatto community prospered. Some, such as William T. Johnson, the barber of Nanchez, <clears throat> even owned slaves. He was the master of 15 bondsmen. His diary records that in June 1848, he flogged two slaves and a mule. The free blacks in the South were kind of a third race. These people were prohibited from working in certain occupations and forbidden from testifying against whites in court. They were always vulnerable to being hijacked back into slavery by unscrupulous trades, slave traders. As free men and women, they were walking examples of what might be achieved by emancipation, and hence were resented and detested by defenders of the slave system. Free blacks were also unpopular in the North, where about another 250,000 of them lived. Several states forbade their entrance, most denied them a right to vote, and some barred blacks from public schools. In 1835, New Hampshire farmers hitched their oxen to a small schoolhouse that had dared to enroll 14 black children and dragged it into a swamp. Northern blacks were especially hated by the pick-and-shovel Irish immigrants with whom they competed for menial jobs. Much of the agitation in the North against the spread of slavery into the new territories in the 1840s and 50s grew out of race prejudice, not humanitarianism. Anti-black feeling was in fact frequently stronger in the North than in the South. The gifted and eloquent former slave Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist and self-educated orator of rare power, was sometimes mobbed and beaten by Northern rowdies. It was sometimes observed that white Southerners, who were often suckled and reared by black nurses, liked the black as an individual, but despised the race. The white Northerner, on the other hand, often professed to like the race, but disliked the individual blacks. Plantation Slavery in society's basement in the South of 1860 were nearly four million black human chattels. Their numbers had quadrupled since the dawn of the century as the booming cotton economy created a seemingly unquenchable demand for slave labor. 
Legal importation of African slaves into America ended in 1808 when Congress outlawed slave imports. But the price of black ivory was so high in the years before the Civil War that uncounted thousands of blacks were smuggled into the South, despite the death penalty for slavers. Although there were several, several were captured, Southern juries repeatedly acquitted them. Only one slave trader was ever executed, N.P. Gordon, and this took place there in New York in 1862, the second year of the Civil War. Yet the huge bulk of the increase in the slave population came not from imports, but instead from natural reproduction, a fact that distinguished slavery in America from other New World societies, and that implied much about the tenor of the slave regime and the condition of family life under slavery. Above all, the planters regarded the slaves as investments into which they had sunk nearly $2 billion in the capital of their capital by 1860. Slaves were such primary form of wealth in the South, and as such, they were cared for as any asset is cared for by a prudent capitalist. Accordingly, they were sometimes, though by no means always, spared dangerous work, like putting a roof on a house. If a neck was going to be broken, the master preferred it to be that of a wage-earning Irish laborer rather than that of a prime field hand, worth $1,800 by 1860, a price that had quintupled since 1800. Tunnel blasting and swamp draining were often consigned to itinerant gangs of expendable Irishmen because those per perilous tacks were death on niggers and mules. Slavery was profitable for, a great, for the great planters, though it hobbled the economic development of the region as a whole. The profits from the cotton boom sucked ever more slaves from the upper to the lower south, so that by 1860 the deep south states of South Carolina, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana each had a majority or near majority of blacks and accounted for about half of all the slaves in the south. Breeding slaves in the way that cattle are bred was not openly encouraged, but of thousands of blacks from the soil-exhausted slave states of the Old South, especially tobacco-depleted Virginia, were sold down the river to toil as field gang laborers on the cotton frontier of the lower Mississippi Valley. Women who bore 13 or 14 babies were prized as rattling good breeders, and some of these <clears throat> fecund females were promised their freedom when they had produced 10. White masters all too frequently would force their attentions on female slaves, fathering a sizable mulatto population, most of which remain unchained. Slave auctions were brutal sights. The open selling of human flesh under the hammer, sometimes with cattle and horses, was among the most revolting aspects of slavery. On the auction block, families were separated by distressing, with distru distressing frequency, usually for economic reasons, such as bankruptcy or the division of property among the heirs. The sundering of families in this fashion was perhaps slavery's greatest psychological horror. Abolitionists decried the practice, and Harriet Beecher so seized on the emotional power of this theme by putting it at the heart of the plot of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Life Under the Lash White Southerners often romanticized about the happy life of their singing, dancing, banjo-strumming, joyful darkies. But how did the slaves actually live? There is no simple answer to this question. Conditions vary greatly from region to region, from large plantation to small farm, and from master to master. Everywhere, of course, slavery meant hard work, ignorance, and oppression. The slaves, both men and women, usually toiled from dawn to dusk in the fields under the watchful eyes and ready whip hand of a white overseer or black driver. They had no civil or political rights, other than minimal protection from arbitrary murder or unusually cruel punishment. Some states offered further protection, such as banning the sale of a child under the age of 10 away from his or her mother, but all such laws were difficult to enforce, since slaves were forbidden to testify in court or even to have their marriages legally recognized. Floggings were common, for the whip was the substitute for the wage incentive system and the most visible symbol of the planter's mastery. Strong-willed slaves were sometimes sent to breakers, wh whose technique consisted mostly of laying lashes on the laying on the lash, a lavish laying on the lashes. Sorry, as an abolitionist song of the 1850s lamented, "Tonight the bondman lord is bleeding in his chains, and loud the falling lashes heard on Carolina's plains." But savage beatings made sullen laborers, and lash marks hurt resale values. There are, to be sure, sadistic monsters in any population, and the planter caste contained its, its share. But the typical planter had too much of his own prosperity riding on the backs of his slaves to beat them bloody on a regular basis. By 1860, most slaves were concentrated in the black belt of the Deep South that stretched from South Carolina and Georgia into the new southwest states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. This was the region of the southern frontier, into which the explosively growing cotton kingdom had burst into a few, in a few short decades. 
As on all frontiers, life was often rough and raw, and in general, the lot of the slaves was harder here than in more settled areas of the Old South. <clears throat> a majority of blacks lived on larger plantations that harbored communities of 20 or more slaves. In some counties of the Deep South, especially along the lower Mississippi River, blacks accounted for more than 75% of the population. There, the family life of slaves tended to be relatively stable, and a distinctive African-American slave culture developed. Forced separations of spouses, parents, and children were evidently more common on smaller plantations and in the Upper South. Slave marriage vows sometimes proclaimed, until death or distance do you part. With impressive resilience, blacks managed to sustain family life in slavery, and most slaves were raised in stable two-parent households. Continuity of family identity across generations was evidence in the widespread practice of naming children for grandparents or adopting the surname not of a current master, but of a forebearer's master. African Americans also displayed their African cultural roots when they avoided marriage between first cousins, in contrast to the frequent intermarriage of close relatives among the ingrown planter aristocracy. African roots were also visible in the slaves' religious practices. Though heavily Christianized by the itinerant evangelists of the Second Great Awakening, blacks in slavery molded their own distinctive religious forms from a mixture of Christian and African elements. They emphasized those aspects of the Christian heritage that seemed most pertinent to their own situation, especially the captivity of the Israelites in Egypt. One of the most haunting spirituals implored, Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. And another lamented, Nobody knows the trouble I've had, nobody knows but Jesus. African practices also persisted in the responsorial style of preaching, in which the congregation frequently punctuates the minister's remarks with assents and amens, an adaptation of the give and take between caller and dancers in the African sh shout-out dance. The Burdens of Bondage Slavery was intolerably degrading to the victims. They were deprived of the dignity and sense of responsibility that comes from the independence and the right to make choices. They were denied an education because reading brought ideas and ideas brought discontent. Many states passed laws forbidding their instruction, and perhaps nine-tenths of adult slaves at the beginning of the Civil War were totally illiterate. For all slaves, indeed, for virtually all blacks, slaves or free, the American dream of bettering one's lot through study and hard work was a cruel and empty mockery. Not surprisingly, victims of this peculiar institution devised countless ways to throw sand in its gears. When workers are not voluntarily hired and adequately compensated, they can hardly be expected to work with alacrity. Accordingly, slaves often slowed the pace of their labor to the barest minimum that would spare them the lash, thus fostering the myth of black laziness in the minds of whites. They filched food from the big house and pilfered other goods that had been produced or purchased by their labor. They sabotaged expensive equipment, stopping the work routine altogether until repairs were accomplished. Occasionally, they, were e they even poisoned their master's food. The slaves also universally pined for freedom. Many took their, to their heels as runaways, frequently in search of a separated family member. A black girl, asked if her mother was dead, replied, Yes, sir, Massa, she is dead, but she's free. Others rebelled, though never successfully. In 1800, an armed insurrection led by a slave named Gabriel in Richmond, Virginia, was foiled by informers, and its leaders were hanged. Denmark Vesey, a free black, led another ill-fated rebellion in Charleston in 1822, also betrayed by informers. Vesey and more than 30 followers were publicly strung from the gallows. In 1831, the semi-literate Nat Turner, a visionary black preacher, led an uprising that slaughtered about 60 Virginians, mostly women and children. Reprisals were swift and bloody. The dark taint of slavery also left its mark on the whites. It fostered the brutality of the whip, the bloodhound, and the branding iron. White Southerners increasingly lived in a state of imagined siege, surrounded by potentially rebellious blacks, inflamed by abolitionist propaganda from the North. Their fears bolstered an intoxicating theory of biological racial superiority and turned the South into a reactionary backwater in an era of progress, one of the last bastions of slavery in the Western world. The defenders of slavery were forced to degrade themselves, along with their victims. As Booker T. Washington, a distinguished black leader and former slave, later observed, whites could not hold blacks in a ditch without getting down there with them. Early Abolitionism The inhumanity of the peculiar institution gradually caused anti-slavery societies to sprout forth. Abolitionist sentiment first stirred at the time of the Revolution, especially among Quakers, 
Because of the widespread loathing of blacks, some of the earliest abolitionist efforts focused on transporting the blacks bodily back to Africa. The American Colonization Society was founded for this purpose in 1817, and in 1822 the Republic of Liberia, on the fever-stricken western African coast, was established for former slaves. Its capital, Monrovia, was named after President Monroe. Some 15,000 freed blacks were transported there over the next four decades, but most blacks had no wish to be transplanted into a strange civilization after having become partially Americanized. By 1860, virtually all southern slaves were no longer Africans, but native-born African Americans, with their own distinctive history and culture. Yet the colonization idea appealed to some anti-slavery rights, including Abraham Lincoln, until some time of the Civil War. In the 1830s, the abolitionist movement took on new energy and momentum, mounting to the proportions of a crusade. American abolitionists took heart in 1833 when their British counterparts unchained the slaves in the West Indies. Most important, the religious spirit of the Second Great Awakening now inflamed the hearts of many abolitionists against the sin of slavery. Prominent among them was the lanky, tussled-haired Theodore Dwight Weld, who had been evangelized by Charles Grandison Finney in New York's burnt-over district in the 1820s. Self-educated and simple in manner and speech, Weld appealed with special power and directness to his rural audiences of untutored farmers. Spiritually inspired by Finney, Weld was materially aided by two wealthy and devout New York merchants, their brothers Arthur and Louis Tappan. In 1832, they paid his way to Lane Theological Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio, where, which was presided over by the formidable Lyman Beecher, father of a remarkable brood, including novelist Harry Beecher Stowe, form, reformer Catherine Beecher, and preacher abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher. Expelled along with several other students in 1834 for organizing an 18-day debate on slavery, Weld and his fellow Lane rebels full of the energy and idealism of youth, fanned out across the Old Northwest, preaching the anti-slavery gospel. Humorless and deadly earnest, Weld also assembled a potent propaganda pamphlet, American Slavery As It Is. Its compelling arguments made it among the most effective abolitionist tracts and greatly influenced Harry Beecher Stowe's, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Radical Abolitionism on the New Year's Day, 1831, a shattering abolitionist blast came from the bugle of William Lord Garrison, a mild-looking reformer of 26. The emotionally high-strung son of a drunken father and a spiritual child of the Second Great Awakening, Garrison published in Boston the first issue of his militant, militantly anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator. With this mighty paper broadside, Garrison triggered a 30-year war of wards and, in a sense, fired one of the opening barrages of the Civil War. Stern and uncompromising, Garrison nailed his colors to the masthead of his weekly. He proclaimed in strident tones that under no circumstances would he tolerate the poisonous weed of slavery, but would stamp it out at once, root and branch. I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard." Other dedicated abolitionists rallied to Garrison's standard, and in 1833 they founded the American Anti-Slavery Society. Prominent among them was Wendell Phillips, a Boston patrician known as Abolition's Golden Trumpet. A man of strict principle, he would eat no cane sugar and wear no cotton cloth, since both were produced by southern slaves. Black abolitionists distinguished themselves as living monuments to the cause of African-American freedom. Their ranks included David Walker, whose incendiary appeal to the colored citizens of the world advocated a bloody end to white supremacy. Also noteworthy were Sojourner Truth, a freed black woman in New York who fought tirelessly for black emancipation and women's rights, and Martin Delaney, one of the few black leaders to take seriously the notion of mass recolonization of Africa. In 1859, he visited West Africa's Niger Valley, seeking a suitable site for relocation. The greatest of the black abolitionists was Frederick Douglass. Escaping from bondage in 1838 at the age of 21, he was discovered by black abolitionists in 1841 when he gave a stunning, impromptu speech at an anti-slavery meeting in Massachusetts. Thereafter, he lectured widely for the cause, despite frequent beatings and threats against his life. In 1845, he published his classic autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. It depicted his remarkable origins as a son of a black slave woman and a white father his struggle to learn, to read, and write, and his eventual escape to the North. Douglas was as flexibly practical as Garrison was stubbornly principled. 
Garrison often appeared to be more interested in his own righteousness than in the substance of the slavery evil itself. He repeatedly demanded that the virtuous North secede from the wicked South, yet he did not explain how the creation of an independent slave republic would bring an end to the damning crime of slavery. Renouncing politics on the 4th of July, 1854, he publicly burned a copy of the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, a phrase he borrowed from a shaker condemnation of marriage. <laughs> Critics, including some of his former supporters, charged that Garrison was cruelly probing the moral wound in America's underbelly, but offering no acceptable balm to ease the pain. Douglas, on the other hand, along with other abolitionists, increasingly looked to politics to end the blight of slavery. These political abolitionists backed the Liberty Party in 1840, the Free Soil Party in 1848, and eventually the Republican Party in the 1850s. In the end, most abolitionists, including even the pacifistic Garrison himself, followed out the logic of their beliefs and supported a frightfully costly fratricidal war as the price of emancipation. High-minded and courageous, the abolitionists were men and women of goodwill and various colors who faced the cruel choice that many people in the ages have thrust upon them. When is evil so enormous that it must be denounced even at the risk of precipitating bloodshed and butchery? The South Lashes Back Anti-slavery sentiment was not unknown in the South, and in the 1820s, anti-slavery societies were more numerous south of the Mason-Dixon line than north of it. But after about 1830, the voice of white Southern abolitionism was silenced. In the last gasp of Southern questioning of slavery, the Virginia legislator debated and eventually defeated various emancipation proposals in 1831 and 1832. <clears throat> that debate marked a turning point. Thereafter, all the slave states tightened their slave codes, and moved to prohibit emancipation of any kind, voluntarily or compensated. Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 sent a wave of hysteria sweeping over the snowy cotton fields, and the planters, in growing numbers, slept with pistols by their pillows. Although Garrison had no demonstrable connection with the Turner conspiracy, his liberator appeared at about the same time, and he was bitterly condemned as a terrorist in, 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 in cipher, insider sorry, of murder. The state of Georgia offered $5,000 for his arrest and conviction. The nullification crisis of 1832 further implanted haunting fears in white southern minds, conjuring up nightmares of black incendiaries and abolitionist devils. Jailings, whippings, and lynchings now greeted national efforts to discuss the slavery problem in the South. Pro-slavery whites responded by launching a massive defense of slavery as a positive good, in doing so, they forgot their own section's previous doubts about the morality of the peculiar institution. Slavery, they claimed, was supported by the authority of the Bible and the wisdom of Aristotle. It was good for Athens, I'm sorry, it was good for Africans, who were lifted from the barbarism of the jungle and clothed with the blessings of Christian civilization. Slave masters did indeed encourage religion in the slave quarters. A catechism for blacks contained such a passage as, Question, who gave you a master and a mistress? Answer, God gave them to me. Question, who says that you must obey them? Answer, God said that I must. White apologists also pointed out that master-slave relationships really resembled those of the family. On many plantations, especially those of the Old South of Virginia and Maryland, this argument had a certain plausibility. A slave's tombstone bore this touching inscription, John, a faithful servant and a true friend. Kindly and considerate, loyal and affectionate, the family he served honors him in death, but in life they gave him love for he was one of them. Southern whites were quick to contrast the happy lot of their servants with that of their overworked northern wage slaves, including sweated, sweated women and stunted children. The blacks mostly toiled in the fresh air and sunlight, not in the dark and stuffy factories. They did not have to worry about slack times or unemployment, as did the hired hands of the north. Provided with a jail-like form of social security, they were cared for in sickness and old age, unlike northern workers, who were set adrift when they had outlived their usefulness. These curious pro-slavery arguments only widened the chasm between a backward-looking South and a forward-looking North, and indeed much of the rest of the Western world. The Southerners reacted defensively to the pressure of their own fears and bristled before the merciless nagging of the Northern abolitionists. Increasingly, the white South turned in upon itself and grew hotly intolerant of any embarrassing questions about the status of slavery. Regrettably, also, the controversy over the free people endangered free speech. In the entire country, 
Piles of petitions poured in upon Congress from the anti-slavery reformers, and in 1836, sensitive Southerners drove through the House the so-called gag resolution. It required all such anti-slavery appeals to be tabled without debate. This attack on the right of petition aroused the sleeping lying in the aged ex-president, Representative John Quincy Adams, and he waged a successful eight-year fight for its repeal. Southern whites likewise resented the flooding of their mails with incendiary abolitionist literature. Even if blacks could not read, they could interpret the inflammatory drawings, such as those that showed masters knocking out slaves' teeth with clubs. In 1835, a mob in Charleston, South Carolina, looted the post office and burned a pile of abolitionist propaganda. Capitulating to Southern oppressors, the Washington government in 1835 ordered Southern postmasters to destroy abolitionist material and called on Southern state officials to arrest federal postmasters who did not comply. Such was freedom of the press, as guaranteed by the Constitution. The Abolitionist Impact in the North <clears throat> Abolitionists, especially the extreme garrisons, were for a long time unpopular in many parts of the North. Northerners had been brought up to revere the Constitution and to regard the clauses on the slavery as a lasting bargain. The ideal of union, hammered home by the thundering eloquence of Daniel Webster and others, had taken deep root, and Garrison's wild talk of secession grated harshly on northern ears. The North also had a heavy economic state in Dixieland. By the late 1850s, the southern planters owned northern bankers, owed northern bankers and other creditors about $300 million, and much of this immense sum would be lost, as in fact it later was, should the Union dissolve. New England textile mills were fed with cotton raised by the slaves, and a disrupted labor system might cut off this vital supply and bring unemployment. The Union during these critical years was partly bound together with cotton threads tied by Lords of the Loom in collaboration with the so-called Lords of the Lash. It was not surprising that strong hostility developed in the North against the boat-rocking tactics of the radical anti-slaverites. Repeated tongue lashings by the extreme abolitionists provoked many mob outbursts in the North, some led by respectable gentlemen. A gang of young toughs broke into Lewis Tappan's New York house in 1834 and demolished its interior, while a crowd in the street cheered. In 1835, with a rope tied around him, he, in 1835, Garrison, with a rope tied around him, was dragged through the streets of Boston by the so-called broadcloth broad mob, but escaped almost miraculously. Reverend Elijah Lovejoy of Alton, Illinois, not content to assail slavery, impunged the chastity of Catholic women. His printing press was destroyed four times, and in 1837, uh, he was killed by a mob and became the martyr of abolitionist. So unpopular were the anti-slavery zealots that ambitious politicians like Lincoln usually avoided the taint of Garrisonian abolition like the plague. Yet by the 1850s, the abolitionist outcry had made a deep dent in, in the northern mind. Many citizens had come to see the South as the land of the unfree and the home of a hateful institution. Few Northerners were prepared to abolish slavery outright, but a growing number, including Lincoln, opposed extending it to the Western territories. People of this stamp, commonly called free soilers, swelled their ranks as the years of the Civil War approached. <laughs>